I think when you look at the goats of anything, just the, the structure and the harmony and the passion, I think when you put it all together, they were creative in how they practiced. They practiced more than most anybody. They probably had as much physical gifts as anybody. And I think they paid the biggest sacrifice. Prominent CEOs, leading economists, iconic investors, insights from the experts. The Walker Webcast with Willie Walker. See who's next. Good afternoon and welcome to another Walker webcast. It is my real pleasure to have Sean Foley with me today. Let me do a quick intro on Sean and then he and I will dive into our conversation. Um, I would give everyone at the top of this um, that uh, as you will hear, Sean does not think there is one golf swing. So if you have tuned into this webcast to figure out exactly how to figure out and create the perfect golf string. There is no such thing in Sean's world as a perfect golf swing. So not that I want you to hang up and go somewhere else, but uh, I think Sean and I are going to dive into some really interesting things, not only as it relates to how to become a better golfer, but quite honestly, how to become a better person, uh, which is really the true genius and brilliance of Sean Foley and why he is such a respected and sought after coach. So Sean Foley is a Canadian born golf instructor who has coached Sean O'Hare, Hunter Mahan, Stephen Ames, Lee Westwood, and Justin Rose, as well as other PGA Tour professionals. He worked extensively with Tiger Woods between 2010 and 2014. Foley has been the head coach of the Canadian Junior Golf Association since 2003 and teaches at Core Golf Junior Academy in Orange County National Winter Gardens, Florida. Foley graduated with an arts degree from Tennessee State University, where he played on the varsity golf team. Sean did not aim for a professional golf playing career, but rather set his mind on becoming an instructor to top players after watching David Ledbetter work with Nick Faldo on the range at the RBC Canadian Open in the early 1990s. So Sean, first of all, welcome. Second of all, your dad worked for DuPont. And as a result of your dad working for DuPont, you moved around a lot as a kid. Um, and didn't really get into golf until you all were living in Southern California uh, when your dad was there. First of all, what was it like moving around a lot as a, as, as, a, as a kid? And then what was it about being in Southern California that got you into golf uh, at a young age? Yeah, I think thanks for having me, Willie. I think it's funny when you hear your bio and you know you're evolving and you hear your bio and, and you're like, oh, that's the old guy. That just when you said the bio was kind of tripping me out at one point, the bio was very present, but it's time. It's interesting. Anyways, I just when you were saying that, I uh, I was like, man, I need a smaller bio. <laughs> um, yeah, I think moving around, um, you know, I can't I can't really put my finger on. I imagine like some of the time it hurt, obviously, you know, you go we were in places for like two and a half years. So you get close to other kids and then you move on. Um, probably harder on my brother than me. Um, but, you know, I think it's a great, what a great opportunity, you know, to be able to go from Canada to Delaware, to San Fran, to LA, to Toronto, to Vancouver, back to Toronto University in uh, Nashville, started working uh, in the golf industry in Florida, back to Toronto. <laughs> Look, I think it's harder for the world to sell you the normal nonsense when you're traveled because you go around and you get to see with your own eyes uh, what's going on in the world. And so I think, what was it, Mark Twain, who said that uh, travel was the venom to bigotry, right? So I don't think you move around a lot and become less open-minded. So I think that was really helpful. But I think as a kid, I think that was, you know, probably a tough thing, uh, uh, moving around a lot. And uh you know, some trauma helps you, some trauma hurts you. I think it probably helped me. Um, but yeah, it's, you know what, I'm 48 that I almost forget some of those, some of those things now, but you know, we had, we were very fortunate to have great friends. Uh, we had great neighborhoods that we lived in. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think, uh, it was definitely an advantage, uh, an advantage for me. So I've heard you say two things about um, both your childhood and then other people's childhood that are a little contradictory. I'll let you sort them out for us. Um, but as you talk about identifying, if you will, what it is in some of your players, 
that, um, and whether they're professional golfers or that they're amateurs who come to you for help, um, going back and understanding everyone's individual experience. And you talk about your own childhood, having some rough times and being insecure and then, and also realizing that you were listening to other people's voices rather than listening to your own voice. And one of the things is I've done some research on the way that you teach is getting people to think about their own voice, their own inner voice, and not thinking and listening too much to other people's voices. So talk for a moment about your own childhood experience and those insecurities and what allowed you to tap into your own inner voice versus external voices. Well, I think when it comes down to these topics, it's I just think it's super important for us to realize just in simple neuroscience terms, right? That that the, the oldest part of our brain is we have a basal ganglia and it's connected to the limbic system. And uh, scientists say that's from our reptilian brain. Obviously other parts of our brain are for the primate brain. And then we have the new brain. And so I think insecurity needing to be accepted, all that stuff. I think a lot of times we look too deeply into that, not realizing that we are pre-programmed for some of those things. Uh, because tribal acceptance is a massive important thing as far as how we are. So I think we'll help a lot of people if they just kind of understand the uh, chronological order of the brain and recognize that a lot of the ways that we are, we are born with this program. So I think things like, I think being insecure is fine now because I think it's, it's fleeting. I think security and insecurity just is kind of this flow. And, you know, some days I feel great. Some days I don't feel so great. I don't, I'm not sure if I try to search for any real solution on why it is that way. I think I've more accepted that regardless of what's happening outside of me, how I feel inwardly uh, can be different in the same external situation. So I do think the whole thing's an inside job for real. Uh, it, I'm just generating my experience of what's going on. And it's based on, I, I think with me as a kid, I think it was easier to fit in. So when you're going from Delaware to California, to San Fran, to LA, to Toronto, um, I think I always felt this real need to fit in. Um, and I, I don't think that that's not, you know, that that's not normal for some people. I think what I did a good enough job of is never losing my identity uh, in, in that time. But, I think it's all it's it's I think it's very important. I, I don't think you could probably meet anyone in the world that you've ever run into who said that they haven't had issues with self-belief and insecurity. And I think where we've made the mistake is trying to write books for people on how they'll never feel like that again, rather than just accepting that it's very much part of being a human being and there's nothing wrong with it, uh, except that you think something's wrong with it. So, you know, that that's you know, when you're sitting there and you have the flu and you feel terrible, you feel terrible because your body's doing an unbelievable job of fighting the thing off. So you kind of have to go through it to get to it a little bit. And I find that, the, you know, in the self-help world, we just see not a lot of structured science and then, you know, 12 chapter books on happiness. Whereas I don't, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not sure if it's something I can read about. <laughs> it's something I feel often. Um, and when I don't feel it, I'm, I don't know if I'm necessarily trying to feel it. So, I mean, you've done so much stuff with, uh, you know, endurance stuff. I mean, that's, that, that's pretty much the, I'm going to quit for the whole time, but I'm going to keep going till I'm done. <laughs> so I, was, I, 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 I climbed up Mount Evans on my bike yesterday. And I will tell you that I went as a, when I was about 13,200 feet and had a headache from the altitude and had another, uh, four miles to go and about a thousand vertical feet to get to the top. I was ready to just dial it in, but fortunately we made it to the top and it was fun. But on that, Sean, let me, let me, let me go. You've talked a lot about situation and circumstance. And one of the things that I think you teach a lot of your players is to accept what you just said a moment ago, which is just, it's just where I am at today. Like take it for what it is here. Now talk for a moment about the differentiation between situation and circumstance. Um, I, I don't know. I think they could almost be synonyms. Uh, but for example, like I'm, I'd like to be aware of, of what's going on. And because I'm, we're out in the world and we're traveling a lot, I find it quite easy at home to be chill and have, there's no problems, right? Uh, it's, or there's better problems. You get on the road, you increase all these people and it be, could become more stressful. But Ideally, the stress is not coming from outside of me. So 
I remember sitting there one day and the lady at American Airlines said, you know, your flight is, uh, is canceled. And I thought, oh man, like, what's my options? And she said, you know, you can fly in the morning. And so I just took it on the chin, like, yeah, it is what it is. And then a week later, same situation with technically less on the line from where I need to be. And I lose my mind on this lady named Donna. <laughs> and poor Donna, I had to tell her after, I know you didn't break the wing. I know you have nothing to do with the wing, Donna. So how can it be the exact same situation outside of me and my reaction is so different? So if the situation actually causes anything to me, then every time that happens, I should react the same way. So sometimes I have players playing great uh, and players playing bad. And when players are playing bad, I have days where I'm just hit with wisdom and that this is exactly where we need to be. This is teaching us all we need to learn right now. And then the other days thinking of, you know, catastrophic what ifs. And I think I'm just aware now that once I say what if, then I just go, okay, that's just, there's nothing to find thinking about this, right? So it's, it's kind of like someone says, how you doing? Uh, everything I had no control of today went really well. And the next day, how you doing? Everything I had no control of didn't go very well today. I mean, that's really, I, I think that mental health, there's a high level of acceptance that we live in this like incredible world with billions of variables. And, and it's amazing how much the tensegrity and how much it's all together. So when you actually go to Orlando, to the airport, get in a plane, fly to LA and everything goes perfect. I mean, that's that's almost probably a miracle. And so it's like with gas prices, right? When gas prices are a are dollar 20, no one says, hey, we're saving money. And they go to 340 and they say, you know, we're getting scammed. And it's like, well, you can't, you got to celebrate the good part too. <laughs> it's, it's a bit of a, uh, it's a bit of both, but maybe that's just in, maybe it's just a human thing. Maybe we, uh, maybe we recognize the bad because um, our whole goal is to survive. I mean, that, that, that part of the brain I was discussing is the survivor brain and it, it will do a lot to undermine the thriver brain. And we see it all the time. We see it in society constantly. Uh, we see it in the amount of self-sabotage that's going on at every single level. But I, so and, Sean, I've, I've heard you for instance say that like sitting in traffic, you got sort of two options. One, bang the steering wheel and get pissed off that you're sitting in traffic or take a deep breath and call your mom and be happy that you have that opportunity to just sit there and get on the phone with her. Yeah, how, do, how do you, how, what's that? It's just all choice, right? Like, it's all choice. How do you translate it, that into your players? Because if you will, many players, when in traffic, <laughs> bang their hand on the steering wheel. What do you do with your players to have them, if you will, reset, recalibrate, say, rather than banging the steering wheel, think about calling your mom? I, I just think at the deepest level, if you realize that all that, the way that you feel at that moment is just connected to old mental constructs and old narratives that really, they're still floating around in the universe of your mind, but they don't, I think as you get older, hopefully, uh, you recognize and, and do and do less like that. And then assess, okay, when you're pissed off, right? Or you're frustrated. Okay, assess, all right, where's the me part of this? Okay, like I'm frustrated. So why am I frustrated? Well, I'm frustrated because I'm in traffic. All right, well, you weren't frustrated last week. Why are you frustrated this week? I got up a little late. I didn't know there'd be this much traffic. And <laughs> it's, I think, I think if you look deeply enough at every single thing you go through, it's kind of comes down to a me problem anyway. So it's it's very rare that the guy's in traffic on the way to the beach on Friday afternoon is losing his mind. So it, it it's uh, I mean, that's just the simple meta perspective. It's like, do you have any control of what is happening? It's very logical, I think, before remember, emotions take place the way that they do because of the absence of logic. And so obviously, when you see your child get married one day, that's going to be very emotional. That doesn't need logic. Right. That's. One of the few things you should save your emotions for is things like that. Most everything that we get emotional about, um, frustration, for example, of being in traffic, frustration comes from really when what you think should be real at that moment is actually not real. So there's, when people can't, I think the most important word that I've ever learned is probably acceptance. And being able to accept things for the way that they are, I think is mandatory because 
most of the time you have to have that. And by accepting, you move back into the present where you control the situation again um, by, by the choice that you have. But it's not really about sitting in, on the golf course and telling yourself positive mantras or anything like that. I just, I'm sorry, I've been yet to proven that any of that scientifically has any effect. I think it's, I think it's a meta perspective. It's a cognitive understanding of, of what life is and hopefully you're learning from it. And then just knowing that we're going to be on a spectrum where we're going to go from up to down. Um, and so what are our, what are the natural ways that we can uh, combat, uh, not combat this, but maybe make it lessen it. So 20 minutes of cardio a day, 20 minutes of breathing, uh, 20 minutes of uh, early sunlight. There's so many ways that we can, put input into our system where it knows how to heal us and take care of us. And I think that, uh, unfortunately in the idea of consumption and, and how a lot of companies make money, breathing sunlight and going for a walk are all free. <laughs> and until someone, until someone can patent that, um, it, it we, I just don't hear it much. And someone like yourself, you've always been active. Your family's active. I was very fortunate to have a dad who used to take me and I hated it. I remember it, but he used to take me to the track when we were kids to run on the weekend. And I think it's just something that you fall into. And then as you get older and you start reading scientific research, you realize like, man, that's one of the most important things that my dad ever did for my health and wellness. It wasn't be my best friend and be super dad. It was actually make me go out and work through, work through the running and work through long distance and want to quit all the time, but keep waking up and keep doing it. And just to see that man, I've been a pretty fortunate kid with mood and everything in my whole life. And I think the idea that I'm outside a lot, uh, that I'm active, um, that I'm breathing, that I'm reading, I just think these are all things that are helpful before we start looking at how I was picked on at eight years old and going to a therapist and talking about my trauma that really isn't going to make a whole lot of difference because it's going to be locked in my brain forever. Um, it's it, It's just... It's just a I feel like it's a bit of a new approach to taking how can we holistically we have this beautiful system um just the amount of neurons you fired yesterday on that bike ride the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide that moved around the system and it's just it's incredible and i think if we really sat there and took the took a look at just the incredible the, the delicacy and, and how articulate our, our nature and our bodies and our systems are, I think that will help people when it comes down to mental health as well. That, you know, if we give ourselves the right input, we'll be, we'll, what, what do little kids do, right? Kids have fun. Obviously part of their brains aren't wired yet. So their ability to think of tomorrow and what happens when the saber tooth tiger comes is not there. Being an adult is, is different than being a kid. I, I don't like when my players have sports psychologists and they're not putting well. And the sports psychologist says, just putt like when you were a kid. And I'm like, well, we have about a trillion more neurons, so that's not really going to happen. Uh, and then Willie, I don't remember kids who made every putt. I remember kids who used sure. to putt putters like eight feet by. Um, but th that is a lot of what it is. It's right. It's like be a shooter, be a player, be a swinger. And it's like, what does that mean? I don't understand. Like, what what does that mean to yell at your player uh uh be 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 a swinger be positive and believe in yourself uh, i don't know that that uh i don't think that's it i'm convinced because so, if it was only that we'd all be outstanding so two things on that and i want to loop back to another question but so last week i had mark few on the walker webcast the gonzaga basketball coach and one of the clips yeah. that we put out there was of mark talking about allowing his players, he had a he had a coach who he learned under, who seemed to have the players looking at the coach as much as they were looking on the court. And Mark's comment was, he said, if I ever become a head coach, um, I want to be able to allow the players to focus exclusively on playing and not on me. And that I'll never kind of be that imposing coach on the sidelines, yelling at the players all the time and having them kind of play here and play there. And one of the things he got to was, I just hope that they can get in this flow state of just playing the game they love but within a broad context and framework of how I want the game plan to go. And I took that clip, Sean, and I sent it to my friend, Greg Carvel, whose UMass Minutemen won the NCAA hockey championship, not this year, but last year. 
And what was so interesting was Greg came back to me and he said, I got to learn something there. And I thought it was amazing that here's, they both had the number one hockey team and the number one basketball team in the country last year. Number one, both Gonzaga as well as UMass at a point in the year. And Greg was still saying, I've got something to learn from Mark on that, which I thought was fantastic. And one of the things that I found about you is that you are incredible at giving credit of your capabilities to all the people you have learned from. And sure. as, as I've listened to you give speeches and I've read what you've written, you consistently go to others as if, yeah, Sean Foley has a unique mix of personality and knowledge and capabilities, but it is all infused and it is all impacted by all of these people that you have learned from. And I, I think it's Bruce Lee, who is one of your mentors, one of the people who you look to often, who said that great teachers constantly adapt. Talk about that for a moment. Yeah, I mean, that's the, you know, the whole thing about being like in this tribe is it takes a village to raise a child, right? And I think that's, that, that's an old saying from way back in human existence probably partially because no one knew who the dad was, right? So it's it's like we did we did raise communities all as one. And I think that, you know, I was just, I think I was fortunate to, one thing, my dad uh, had, had, a, had, a, had a library. My dad had a lot of biographies. And so I got very interested in reading about people. Uh, so I read a lot, by the time I was like 17 or 18, I'd read probably, I don't know, at least parts of 30 or 40 different biographies of people who'd been evil and people who'd been unbelievable. And it, I just noticed like, man, all these people who've had a big effect on the planet, they had a real process. So they had a belief system for sure. And then they had a process. Then they were all fine with delayed gratification. Uh, and they just kept moving and moving and moving and moving. And so once again, it's, you know, the, the, the simple saying it's, not how many times you get knocked down, it's how many times you get up. I think that, that, is, that that's something that's going to probably miss for the rest of society because it's definitely been lessened than it was, right? My kids are softer than I was. I was probably softer than my dad was. Um, so when, when it comes down to the amount of people that I've listened to and read, um, I'm reading a book right now by a guy named Dr. Raymond Pryor, who I met at the KP, KPGA Women's Championship. I was with Lydia Ko last year and her friend Lindy had this guy on the bag caddying. And I just had thought he was a caddy, of course, because he was caddying. And uh, him and I were talking and he made a couple comments and I was like, wow, this guy's pretty dope. Like that was what he said, it kind of hit me. I was like, wow. That... So I started talking to him and he was a, a clinical psychologist who's gotten into sports. He'd worked with a lot of Olympic shooters. Um, a lot of people, doesn't name names, but he's worked with a lot of people. So as soon as I listened to him, I was like, I got to know what he knows. And I've always been like that. Um, and, you know, people can say it's like, I don't know why it is. It's just part of society where people say, oh, that person's stealing this person's information, this information. Look, everyone at MIT and everyone at Stanford are technically stealing Newton's information. Then, right? Like it's, it's a silly way. It's, it's knowledge. It needs to be passed on. When knowledge is passed on and goes through different experiences, it becomes wisdom. So, yeah, I, I just guess I've been very fortunate to be egoless enough, not saying I have no ego, but egoless enough to consult to and pay people uh, quite a bit of money over the years where I've had, you know, five to eight of my own coaches uh, where I have Zoom calls with them and we talk about life and business and all these different aspects. And uh I think it's really important, especially in my role as a coach, because sometimes when you just coach all the time, you stop remembering what it's like to be a student or what it's like to be the learner. So I find when you take you when you when you do new things and learn new things, you know, it, it helps me realize when I'm coaching that I'm probably too far ahead of that person right now. Like I need to slow it down and I need to simplify it's probably too much because when I go, I learned Pilates a year ago, I've been doing it. And I kept telling the teacher, I can't, I can't put the thing between my arms because I don't even know how to use my legs yet. So we just one, one step at a time. And, and, you know, I think that if you read 10 people, you know, you read 10 different essays on Liberty, 
there's going to be people that you probably are going to fit in more with naturally based on your own experience, socialization, religion, whatever. Um, um, almost the brainwashing, like we need to unlearn a lot of our childhood, I think, when it comes down to things like that. But then someone might have like a totally different situation. So as a Canadian, I come down here and there's a lot of there's a lot of things going on in America that I've never really dealt with in Canada. So, for example, we don't have guns in Canada which is just not, we fight a lot, but we don't really have guns. So when people are like, oh, so you're against guns. I'm like, well, I would, I don't want a gun myself, but you have the right to use, you have the right to have one. I don't think you should be afraid of everybody as much as you are, but everyone I know with the gun walkers never killed, and it is never killed anyone. Do you know what I mean? Like ever. So I try to look at it through that lens of like, one, it's not really my opinion. And two, I hear what you're saying on this side, but but I also hear what they're saying on this side. And then I have to find the, the part that makes sense to me. I can't be a robot for anyone's views. I want to have my own viewpoint on anything. And I think one that comes from having your own worldwide experience, but, but reading a lot and reading, reading completely different things, reading a book that is a book about atheism. And then a book is directly about theism. I think that it's, really important that if you can move out to those extremes, you can start to throw out what things aren't and really find the basis of it. And I think the basis is all the same, right? Like we're all humans going through the same experience, whether you're Republican, Democrat, Muslim, Christian, at the end of the day, our problems are similar, our fears are similar. Um, I, just don't, I, I just don't think we could be that divided uh, unless we've unless unless it's been made it's been an attempted division because i just think that uh we're all very similar <laughs> so when you talk about our fears are similar um zach johnson tuesday practice round at saint andrews goes out plays with dustin johnson comes in turns to you and says man i just played around with dj and that guy is on fire there's no way i'm going to play well this weekend and Zach Johnson goes on to win. So talk for a moment about mindfulness, being in the moment and confidence versus a lack of confidence. Well, good, the good thing is in life, Tuesday is not Wednesday. And even Wednesday, morning, <laughs> even, even Wednesday morning is not Wednesday afternoon, right? Um, that's always good to remind yourself. Oh yeah, okay, it, this, is, this is, I've just had a, a bad hour. It doesn't mean that it's gonna last. It's gonna last as long as I allow it, I guess it comes down to that. Um, Did you say I, anything to Zach Johnson at that moment after playing that round with DJ well, that kind of got him re re engaged? Well, no, he's just a friend of mine. I don't coach him. I just, I just, I was done at work and I was walking home and it was pouring rain and the rain was like stinging. It was coming in sideways and he was just sitting there getting soaked. And so I, I, I was too interested and I asked him and, he went on and on. And then that Saturday, I'm sitting in the airport in Glasgow, having a beer, watching him win. And uh, it really proved my theory on uh, mindfulness and confidence. Um, it's Like I said, on Tuesday, you can feel like the worst player in the world. You can feel like the worst CEO who ever lived. And on Wednesday, you could be walking around personally calling yourself the GOAT. And that is life. And it bounces around like that, I think. It doesn't really matter if you feel like you're terrible or you feel like you're the best. Uh, I think if you train properly and you work on your skill sets and when it comes to pro golf, you look at the probabilities. OK, we have strokes gain data on the PGA Tour. Right. So they created Mark Brody, uh, Columbia University, created strokes gain data. And what he did with that, why he did it was in an individual sport like golf, it's pretty easy to see why Federer beat Nadal or vice versa, because one had one enforced errors. One had more aces. It's easy to see that. But in golf, guys are teeing off at different times in the day. You have different weather. You have different winds. Some guys tee off in the morning. It's perfect out. And in the afternoon, it's like a tornado, right? So how do you, in an individual sport, how do you see where you are good or where you need to improve? So with strokes gained, like strokes gained off the tee is a metric. So that would be when you're hitting your driver. Um, when the data came out, it showed that distance was much more pivotal to lower scoring than accuracy. But in the old belief system in golf, it was all about how straight you hit it. 
So the problem with systems and beliefs is that if you don't challenge a belief system, you will continue to see exactly your belief system. So you might not see what is going on. So you start seeing these guys that are hitting at 330, but they're hitting it all over the place and they're winning more tournaments. That really changed guys on like, oh man, I, I got to work on this. Then there's strokes gained approach. So being able to get every iron shot hit for the year, then there's uh, 30 yards in and then there's putting. But most, a lot of people don't really see themselves well. So where guys think they're good, they're sometimes not good at all. And where sometimes guys think they're bad, they're actually very good. And so when people tell me that, you know, champions are self-assured and they're positive and they never lose focus, I don't know who they're talking about because I've met all of them in different sports and they trained at a high level. They trained in different ways. Uh, they trained for longer. They, a lot of times they just were very passionate about the mundane. So I think when you look at the goats of anything, just the, the structure and the harmony and the passion and probably some chip on the shoulder because we're human beings and that's part of survival. Darwin was not adaptation comes from that. Um, I think when you put it all together, they were creative in how they practiced. They practiced more than most anybody. They probably had as much physical gifts as anybody. Uh, and I think they paid the biggest sacrifice. Um, so when they, you talk, when you talk about practice, Sean, I got a thousand friends who I played golf with over time who say, I can't take it from the range to the course. Yeah, exactly. I can't take it from the range to the course. Now, my understanding is that your players practice 20% of the time and play 80% of the time. Well, that's the dream. That's the dream. Okay. Well, dream not, but the point here is that you would rather have them playing and dealing with situational awareness slash challenges than sitting on the range hitting 500 drivers over and over and over again. Talk for a moment about why you think it's so important to dealing with the situational awareness of being on the course versus just honing that stroke. Well, think, think about your ride yesterday that you took. OK, so you could go to like a really nice gym that has a that has an elevation chamber and you could ride a bike and you could set it to 13000 feet and it will be hard. It'll be harder than it will be sitting in the other part of the room. It's just way different. <laughs> it is just it is just way every single time yesterday, your tire just got stuck in a little spot and you had to use a little more quad than you would. It, so, yes, it's still nice that that you could train like that, but it's, you look at a lot of the world-class distance athletes and they train at elevation and come down to sea level and they're insane and it makes sense, right? So once again, training at elevation would be way more painful than being down on that treadmill. So when you say, man, you know, I've been training for this marathon and I've just been running 26 miles a day every day on the treadmill. And at the 15th mile today, I just couldn't keep, I couldn't go anymore because it's all just the little tiny things that happen along that run that change it. So yes, you give yourself a chance to do the task if you do that, but we have to look at it slightly differently than that. So every single tee shot that you hit on the golf course, the intention is probably slightly different. And so when you get on a range, one, there's no consequence. I mean, you can, you can work and play mental games to try to provide, you, you can say to somebody, just pretend this is the last hole of the US Open, you have to start it here and do it here. And you can do that. And I remember when I used to do that, I'd say, oh my God, I sound so silly because the difference is gonna be that um, the, the walk from the 17th green to the 18th hole is like a 300 foot hill. And then when we get to the top, we're gonna look at 100,000 people. Right. <laughs> it's, you can't train that unless you're in that. Um, but you know, you look to other operators like the Navy SEALs. I read a, a, a great story about, um, their training for Islamabad when they went to take out uh, Osama bin Laden and how they built to within their own knowledge, a structure that was identical. And they had done like 600 revolutions of different things. Um, and they actually did one where the helicopter went down. So when that helicopter went down, it probably sucked, but been here, done that before. 
So why are we going and practicing what we're good at? Like, why is it way harder to get at the gym on a bench rack than a squat rack? <laughs> you, squat racks are always open. Well, you can just go squat whatever you want, but there's no dumbbells for bench press. It's because squatting is like more annoying and it's harder, but it's way better for you. And so when I look at how my players practice, over that's been the biggest challenge to my coaching is where I felt a bit insecure was too much in the model of, perfection and angles and doing everything great, which I'm glad I learned that uh, 100%. But just understanding that you're only really as good as your weaponry. With my young players that I have now, most of them are quite young. I look a lot at that data and then start to build practice around that. And so most of the practice is on the golf course. For example, uh, Monday, one of my players, Sam Horsfield, plays on the Live Tour and the European Tour. Sam is a natural. The kid is as good as you can be at golf. Uh, he hates to practice. Uh, he's he's very, very good player. But I don't know how we're going to go from 70th to 10th in the world if we don't do more of what we need to do. So Justin Rose would sit there and practice for four days in a row. And we would hit thousands of balls. And we would have data. And we'd be measuring. And his workouts would be perfect. His diet would be perfect. Sam Horsefield's 25. Sam's idea of healthy food is Chipotle. Um, his idea of chilling at night is Call of Duty. Uh, yeah, I, I, this is the donkey generation. There's no doubt about it. It's, I'm so happy Sam's good at golf. <laughs> but Sam's a beautiful kid and he's, he's such a special mover and such a special player. So I have to, regardless of what I think works, that's what I think works. What could be more arrogant as a coach to think that your preference is right for everybody. I mean, that is just almost narcissism. So we've come up with a, a great solution to where Monday he has to play worst ball. So he tees off and he plays two balls, has to pick the worst one, 18 holes. The next day... Uh, Hold on, go on that for a second. I love that concept and many people don't, but talk for two seconds on worst ball because... I think worst ball talks so much about how you instruct and teach. Just you just jumped over it. I just for two seconds explain what worst ball is. Yeah. So uh, Tiger was uh, infamous for worst ball. So Tiger would play. Uh, I live right now in this house. I'm probably only a mile away from the back of the range where I work, and that's where Tiger's old house is. And so I'd heard stories for a long time that Tiger used to play worst ball like all the time. So two balls off the first tee, hit them both, whichever one was the worst one. Then he's got to play two balls from there, whichever one is the worst one. So it's all the way through the green. So you hit a ball to four feet, you hit a ball to eight feet. Now you got to hit two from eight feet. Well, eight feet, you're at 50%. So I think it's a, such a great teacher because I think Arnold Palmer had it like nailed, eh? Like per any, of course he's the king. And so he was such an elegant player and he was very athletic, but he never really let much get to him. And they said he had a great nature, but I don't think it was that. I think it was his philosophy. So his most famous quote is golf is deceptively simple and endlessly complicated. Right. And might as well, you might as well call it life. Why not? It's the same game really. Right. <laughs> You're out by yourself. You have no control over all these variables outside of you. You may have someone carrying your bag, but that they're just carrying your bag. They can't hit it for you. You can't ditch it to the you can't ditch it to the running back when you know you're about to throw an interception. It's it is really the life game, you know. So if I deceive you, I lie to you. So even when the game seems simple, it's a lie. It's a lie. <laughs> and the fact that he had fully accepted that it was endlessly complicated. Well, if you accepted that something is endlessly complicated, to the like. To the root of your vagus nerve, you said, this is endlessly complicated. I mean, how pissed off are you going to get? You're not. So I, I think that what worst ball does is it shows you how hard it is to back up a world-class shot. And I think it should humble you to the sense that maybe you're not as good as you think you are. And, you know, one of the things I don't like my guys to do is when we go out to play in a practice round, they hit a bad shot, they hit it, they drop another ball and they do it again. They don't hit that one good. They hit another one. And I'm like, man, you get one chance tomorrow. Like, why are we not playing from the right trees when we may have to actually play from the right trees? So 
I think, you know, where Tiger was the best, obviously, is he shot the best score every day. And I think I've had to test over the years how much vanity was part of what I was doing and having the best looking swings and all these types of things. And it's just become more about revenue than perfection, I think. And so it's, you know, Sam playing worst ball. I'll tell you what, you, you shoot around even par and worst ball and you could win on any tour in the world. And then the second day we go out and play with five clubs. So this is all about creativity and feel and touch. Um, Wednesday, we play the back tees, the middle tees, and the front tees, all for score. Uh, nine holes, you get 27 holes. And you get to play three different golf courses. So when it comes to training, the more different environments I had, those SEALs did a lot of different sorties. They did the first one. This is your vanilla. This could happen. Boom. All the way to the point of the helicopter goes down. Where are you going to go? So they're training all these different scenarios. And in doing so, um, you know, becoming more celestial in it because the more opportunities I have to see different environments, the processing and the brain is so we're, remember, we're amazing. Even if we think we're assholes, we're still incredible. We still have to recognize that. So the more opportunities that I give myself to learn from different situations, knowing that after that 27 holes, Sam goes to go home and play. He, well, he's got, now he's got a formula one. Um, uh, he's got a, a formula one, uh, Literally. Simulator. Simulator. Yeah, it's good now. So that's good. That's, we moved on from Call of Duty. So I'm, I, I think his thumbs are going to be okay now. Uh, there's a lot of thumb injuries with young players on tour, by the way. That's actually a true thing, Willie. Um, so let me, let me, Sean, on this, just I want to put one quick stat on the SEALs because I've heard you give a stat in a previous talk that I thought was fascinating. And then I want to come back on Tiger for a second. Um, the stat I heard you say was there six to 700 Navy SEALs and they shoot more rounds of ammunition in a year than the entire Marine Corps, which is 250,000 people. And I heard you say that, and it just, it hit home with me as it relates to, well, wow, think about that. That's what they want. You're talking about situational awareness. They want the SEALs being this elite corps, and so they want them practicing and hanging upside down outside of a helicopter, shooting in, you know, uh, uh, the, their, their machine guns rather than just sitting at the range and going over and over and over again to try and hone it in. Um, I thought that was just, I love that you mentioned that in a previous talk that I listened to that you'd done. But that goes back to like, you know, your friends, right? And saying, I can't take it from the range of the course. So. Right. If I brought my track man on the range, track man now has this software where every shot will give you strokes gain. So it'll say, okay, uh, Willie, you got to hit this seven iron between 150 and 154, just like you do on the course. Okay. So what people realize when they do that, like four yard difference, there's 12 feet. That's not easy to do. And so what happens on the range, because there's no measurement, you hit a ball every eight seconds. You normally make a decent lie. Like very few people put it in a shitty lie on the driving range. Right. Okay. Um, Tiger, when he got around the green, when we used to practice back in the day, uh, he would get on the green. He'd always take his club and he'd always tap the ball down. He'd always give it a worse lie. Always. Every time. And I know guys who Willie, really, they literally put it on the tee. It's, it, it's like, we are never going to get that lie ever. Um, so by practicing out of worse lies, what you start to see is there are different creative ways to play this. There isn't. This is called take your medicine and chip it out to 15 feet and don't make six. So by changing the environment constantly, the one game I like too is on Thursdays, they play the back tees with no woods because I have noticed in 20 years on the PGA tour almost that we don't practice hitting enough long irons. And when, if you look at the players who really separate themselves at the highest level, they're all great long iron players. So playing that game twice a week from the back tees with no woods, guys start to swing three irons and two irons faster and faster um, and then have a lot longer clubs coming in. So I'd say the most, probably the most hit club on the PGA Tour in practice is an eight iron. And it's probably the least used on the golf course because an eight iron safe. It's got loft. It doesn't curve much. I feel comfortable with it. I don't look like a jackass out here. Uh, so that I think that's the biggest change in my in my coaching is moving more away from instruction. Uh, I feel like reading about the brain instruction becomes tricky because once you get someone at a certain age, 
And, and those neurons and neural pathways, they're pretty, pretty wired. It's tricky. So could we have less blue light earlier at night? Could we sleep better? Could we get circadian rhythms better? Could we stop drinking Red Bull on the way to the golf course? I have two that I'm dealing with that right now. And that's astonishing to me that <laughs> they're drinking Red Bull on the way to play golf. Um, so hopefully in time, they won't do that. I, I think, I mean, there's so many parallels to the corporate world where many of us try and focus on the thing we do best and to create adaptability and diversity and diversity of products, diversity of delivery systems. There's not a deal that doesn't have some hiccup that comes along the way. And if you're just trying to practice to the perfect loan in my world, you're, you know, good luck meeting your clients demands when they come in with something you've never seen before. And so there's just so many parallels between how you coach and what we do in the corporate world. Just looping back for a second, Sean, to you and Tiger, um, do you really think that A-Rod was a better baseball player without steroids than Derek Jeter? Yeah. 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 That's, that's a whole other, that's a whole other discussion on the world at large, isn't it? Um, yes, I do. Yes. So I you like got to, you got to clue in our listeners on why I ask you that question and the story behind that. Cause I think it's a, I think it is a fascinating anecdote. Basically. So what Willie's talking about is uh, years ago at the master's, uh, I was on the range with Tiger and we are like the last ones on the range. And my dad and brother were in town for the masters. I got them some tickets somehow. And anyways, we're on the range and uh, you can see when you're on the range at Augusta and you look up the hill, you can see it all. You can see ESPN, you can see NBC and you can see the giant red light. So, you know, the cameras zoomed in and, and it's, it's on you. And um, I, over time, just as you evolve and you adapt, I just started to know where every boom mic was. I knew where every camera was. I knew who every journalist was. Uh, it was fascinating time. Like, it was crazy time. Um, I still sometimes can't even believe it happened yet. And it's been over for like eight years. It's amazing. Um, he's, still, he's still my favorite player too. <laughs> so is me and Tiger were arguing and but what it was, I wouldn't say it probably looked like very vehement or, or dismissive or anything, but we were just discussing and uh, the commentator up in the uh, booth was saying, Brandel Chambly was saying, you can tell the Tiger's done with all the, all the mechanics and all the instruction. It's time to let him go play and just look at the body language on these two. And so when I got home and I walked in the door, um, you know, still feeling pretty awesome that I was just with Tiger Woods on the range at Augusta, uh, which is still amazing to me. I walked home, uh, probably feeling myself a little bit and saw my dad and my brother. I walked in and they just turned around like I looked like a ghost. And then they explained to me, they wanted to know what happened and what were you up, what was going on? And Tiger and I were talking about uh, Jeter and A-Rod. And I said, without steroids, uh, A-Rod was a better athlete than Jeter. And that was our discussion. And they blew it up into uh, an hour of television. So I just thought it was so amazing that like there are all these analysts sitting there from outside, not knowing what you were talking about, and the and they're all sitting there thinking that you're arguing with them over his, you know, his backswing and 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 the velocity with which he's hitting applying the the club, and it ended up being you guys having a fun argument about two professional baseball players who both came out about using steroids and which one was better, and it, I just I when I heard you tell that, Sean, I just sort of said so many of us. So much of the information we get in the world that we're in, we think we know what's going on. Someone else has interpreted what's going on. Unless you're actually there, unless you're Sean Foley talking to Tiger Woods about A-Rod being better than Derek Jeter, you just don't know. And careful about making too many assumptions about what the Golf Channel analyst thinks you're talking about and making conclusions about saying, Sean Foley ought to just let Tiger go play when that had yeah. nothing to do with what the two of you were talking about. You know what that where that whole time kind of ruined me a little bit too like it really ruined me a little bit too it's like it's like listening to someone talk about why not to have a vaccine listen to someone talk about why to have a vaccine listen to what someone thinks about ukraine what someone thinks about ukraine what this person is talking about uh, gun rights what this person is talking about gun rights and i just got to the point where it was like i i just don't really feel like anyone has a freaking clue of what they're talking about, because unless you are right there in the midst of it, this whole Ukraine thing, at a deep level, someone understands why this is happening, but we just listen to 16 people a night talk about it and talk about it and talk about it. And depending on, on what side you're on, uh, it's gonna be completely different. So 
I've, I've found often like how it really helped me in a way was I, I wouldn't say I've ever been someone to really talk about people. I, that's not, uh, that's not, that's something that I've done, but I always try to let people know when I'm around them, if they're talking about someone who's not in the room, I'm, all, I'm always quick to remind them that. Uh, and they don't like this uh, in many cases. It's like, yo, check in with yourself. Like, would you say what you're saying right now if that person was right here? So if not, then you need to figure out why it is that you feel that you need to get attention speaking about someone else's life. And so I'm kind of that guy, a bit, I'm a bit annoying like that, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a weird thing to go through and, and to the amount of people who have met me and have apologized and said, man, I, you know, I thought you were arrogant and you're just an unbelievable guy. And I'm like, Hey, just wait until you meet someone before you define who, who, who they are. So the issue I took with those guys, I mean, look, I took the job, Willie, at the end of the day, if my theory is that everything is a me problem, then the genesis of the problem was me saying, yeah, I'll do that job. Because at that time I was, I would say I was pretty arrogant. Um, I wasn't nearly as skilled as I am now, but I definitely was way more arrogant. Um, I've lost a lot since then. So that kind of knocks that out of you. Um, <laughs> but, but I'm working with a guy who got divorced a year ago, who was an absolute deity, who turned into a punchline overnight. He's already had six surgeries and that ah, give me a couple months. It'll be better than ever. And yeah, no, um, it didn't quite work out that way. And we had a, we had a great time and I think we did pretty well together for sure. Um, but it, when it comes down to speculating or assuming, I mean, how good of a word is assume, right? Cause when you take the word assume and you put a hyphen between the S and the U yep. and make an ass out of you and me. I mean, how good is that? How good is that word? <laughs> it's the best. So um, people have been seeing as you put your arms up during this uh, webcast, Sean, that you have um, tattoos on your arms. One of the tattoos you have is a Bob Marley lyric from the Redemption song. Why is that on your arm? Uh, you know, I, I love my mom is from Guyana in the West Indies. So I grew up. Uh, well, my dad's from Scotland. So he but he was more like into soul music and then like Zeppelin and Pink Floyd and the Beatles. But my mom was uh, more into reggae and like Stevie Wonder. And I was lucky. My mom would play Roberta Flack, Anita Baker, uh, Stevie Wonder. I mean, it was so it, such good music, you know. Um, I was really fortunate that way because music's been a big part of my life for sure. I, I love music. And so she always had like my parents had just boxes full of records. And I used to just sit there and put in one after the other. And I just fell in love with uh, that Trenchtown live album. I must have been 10 years old. Um, and I thought, you know, Bob was, I'd seen him on TV a little bit. And he had these dreads and he jumped around the, sta the, the stage. And he just seemed like he had a different aura about him. And I, I think he obviously really did, right? I mean, that's one of the, probably one of the most influential musicians of the last 200 years. Um, and so that the song Redemption song, um, he says, e emancipate yourself from mental slavery. None but ourselves can free our minds. And Redemption Song was the last song that he wrote before he died of brain cancer. Um, so I would, I, would, I would listen to the lyrics and I would write some of the lyrics down and then I would go and speak to my dad about it. And so my dad was big into that lyric and then he was big into man is uh, born free yet everywhere he is in chains, which I think is Rousseau. So I was, kind of, I was big into philosophy too. I really liked it. And so my dad said, when you can figure out what Rousseau means uh, by that, then you will. Well, I'm like, no, but he says it means this and this. He's like, no, that's what he thought it means. He goes, I think it means something slightly different. And so I remember being like 31 and calling my dad and telling him that uh, uh, to end off the Rousseau quote, man is born free yet everywhere he is in chains, shackled to the confines of his own mind. And that completely hit at the exact same moment with freeing myself from my own mental slavery and putting myself in bondage and in chains of thinking like others, being taught that this is life, which I really, I just look at as like the prison of our mind, right? Is we've got this amazing brain. Most of the people have done unbelievable things, use a lot of creativity and free thought. And then we're just, I mean, look at America this year, 30th in educational standards in the world. How is that not the biggest problem that we have with our country right now? 30th, 
30th. I mean, that's very on purpose, right? That's not like by accident that that happens. So, you know, it just makes it really easy for things to spread. They do like right now with all these thought viruses on all the stuff and this channel saying this and this other channel saying this and fake lies and fake news and lie, lie, deny. You know, it's, it's a crazy, it's a crazy time, but I, I feel like people are pretty uneducated in the sense of that people aren't that well traveled outside the country. And then it becomes really easy to scare people and make people think that all this stuff's happening when it's really not happening. Um, and I think, I think both sides are, uh, are obviously responsible for it. I'm not really sure if I've met a politician, I met quite a few of them who care more about me than they care about them. Um, I'm just not naive to this thing, you know, to this whole, to this whole world. And I find that a lot of that information is painful and it hurts to know it. But in a way, I think when you are trying to at least seek the truth of things, um, you get to see life more for what it is, you know? So to end on a positive note, there is one other tattoo on you, which is a quote from Nelson Mandela. Tell our listeners what that one is and what that says. Uh, Mandela was a huge influence on me growing up. I, my mom and dad, they, I mean, that was almost like forced, I think. And I'm glad they forced me to know everything about him because he was just, you know, he's once in a generation. Um, and I would advise anybody to like, look at those people who are once in a generation and find out everything you can about them. Um, I think they're pretty ordinary people who just really chose to live extraordinary lives. I don't think they were born any different than, than anybody else, but um, basically he says, uh, if, uh, 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 if hatred, uh, if hatred can be, uh, if hatred can be learned, then love can be taught. And, uh, you know, it, you just, I think it's very important. It helps me with people, uh, in the world. Cause you know, you obviously disagree with a lot of people and people disagree with you. And I've got plenty of friends that people are stunned that we're friends because they're like, you guys are so different and think completely different things. And I'm like, well, the, the dynamics are we both love our wife, we both love our kids, and we both enjoy drinking Coronas on a nice day outside. So, Sean, it's been a real pleasure. I, you know, as I said at the top, there is no perfect golf swing. And I think one of the reasons you're such an incredible coach is because you realize that it's that A, there's so many metaphors between the life we all live and the way people play golf, the game of golf, as you wrote, as you said so articulately on the Arnold Palmer uh, quote, um, and that, you know, so much of you being a successful coach isn't necessarily the take back off the tee, which, by the way, anyone who's listened to this, if you want to hear Sean talk technical, you can go listen to Sean talk technical till he's blue in the face. There's there's everything from grip strength to take back speed to club head speed to everything else. I've listened to it. It's fascinating. If you really want to dial in on your stroke, he's the man. But the bigger thing is with these elite athletes, these athletes who have so much both to gain and to lose by showing up in a certain mindset, in a way of dealing with the adversity of golf. And Sean has worked with the very best in the world to be able to work through those issues, which have so many metaphors to the lives that all of us live every single day. And so, Sean, thank you for spending an hour with me. It's fascinating stuff. It's obvious you are an extremely well-read and well-learned person. And uh, good luck uh, with all of your athletes and their performance and uh, and as well with your family, which I know you spend a ton of time focusing on your kids and being a great dad. Sean, a real pleasure. Thank Thanks everyone for joining us this week. We'll be back next week with another Walker webcast. Appreciate it. Take care, Sean. All right. Thank you. See ya.